Hello, and welcome back to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we challenge, encourage, and most importantly, equip you with the practical strategies and encouragement that you need to be all in in faith and family. On today's podcast, we are speaking with Michelle Couchat, author of the brand new book, Relentless, The Unshakable Presence of a God Who Never Leaves. In today's podcast, Michelle is speaking with us not only about how to trust God when we're in the midst of a trial, how we can cling to him when things don't look very good, but also the things that we need to do right now before the trials hit so that no matter what life throws our way, and it always does, that we will be ready with a strong, unshakable faith in God that he will come through. Honestly, I loved this conversation with Michelle. I found it so practical and encouraging, and I just know you're going to love it too. All right. Well, I am so excited to have Michelle Kashat on the podcast today. Thank you, Michelle, so much for agreeing to talk with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so glad to be here. Well, will you start us off just by telling us a little bit about you for anybody who is not familiar with you, um, basically who you are and what you do? All right. My name's Michelle Kashat. I am a wife and a mom of six kids, ages. Are you ready? You might want to sit down. Ages 27, 26, 22, 13, 12, 12. Four boys, two girls, <laughs> and now I'm tired. Uh, and I am, I make a living as a, an author, a speaker, a communicator. Actually, a lot of what I do is I do communications coaching for individuals who are presenters, people who speak on big platforms, big stages, but also do a lot of executive coaching and leadership coaching with men and women who want to use their gifts to the best of their ability and to God's glory in this generation. That is awesome. So I want to hear specifically, though, about your book that you have coming out um, around this time. It is called Relentless the unshakable presence of a God who never leaves. Can you tell us a little bit about what this book is about, who it's for, um, all the things? In short, I've always believed in Jesus. In fact, my parents became Christians when I was just a few months old. So really, there is not a time in my life where faith wasn't a significant part. And the truth is, is I've just always loved Jesus. I've always wanted to follow him. I've always wanted to serve him in some kind of way, which was all nice and good and fairly easy to do when life was easy. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but it's easy to have faith when life is going according to plan. What I wasn't prepared for, however, was when starting in my 20s until present day, I would go through a series of consecutive losses and um, and difficulties and challenges and devastating health news that would literally shake my faith to its core. And that's what this book is about. It's, it's about the destruction of my faith and then how God has faithfully rebuilt it one layer at a time to a place where what I thought would destroy my faith, my doubts, my questions, uh, my unanswered Um, confusion. What I thought would destroy my faith has actually become the means to making it stronger than it's ever been. Are you able to share any of those things that you went through that you mentioned? Because I know you said you went through a lot of things. Um, I'm just wondering what kinds of things that you're going to. Well, uh, this is the Cliff Notes version. It, It began when I was in my 20s and I was a pastor's wife and unexpectedly six days before Christmas found myself a single mom raising a one and a half year old alone. It's a, it's a story that's not entirely mine to tell, but I discovered that the man that I was married to and loved had an entirely second secret life that I didn't know anything about. And so I was 27 years old and overnight went from being a pastor's wife and mama to a single mom trying to find a job. That was the first thing that happened. Uh, a few years later, I met a man named Troy, a wonderful man, and we ended up getting married. He had two boys. I had one boy. And we did that nice, easy thing called blended family, right? It's just like the TV show, Brady Bunch. It's all going to be fine. Not so much. <laughs> and so we dove right into step family, blended family. We had those challenges for a number of years. And just about the time we thought that everything was uh, like we were turning the corner and things would start to work out. 
uh, I got a phone call on a Tuesday before Thanksgiving and a doctor on the other end informed me that I had squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue, cancer of the tongue. As a woman who makes her living as a communicator and a communicator, a coach to communicators, uh, it was quite shocking and unnerving. I had no idea that cancer of the tongue was even a thing. What followed is that they found out that it was caught early and we, we had surgery. I had part of my tongue removed and uh, we never expected to see cancer again. The doctor told me multiple times, you have nothing to worry about it. We got it all, you'll be fine. But what happened in the years that followed is that cancer came back two more times for a total of three times. And by the third diagnosis, two thirds of my tongue was removed. Uh, they did a nine hour surgery to take out two thirds of my tongue. They had to cut my arm open from wrist to elbow to take out blood vessels and tissue to try to rebuild some semblance of a tongue. They um, cut open my neck as well to take out lymph nodes and my submandibular gland uh, and multiple other things for that surgery. After giving me a few weeks to recover from that surgery, they started intensive chemotherapy and external radiation. And literally what the doctor said is we need to take you to the brink of death in order to maybe, maybe save your life. Uh, and that has been four and a half years ago now. By the time all of that ended, I had scars all over my body. I had burns from my nose to my chest. I had um, only about 20% of my taste left. I had to learn how to eat, drink, swallow and talk all over again. And my life as I knew it was literally turned upside down. Uh, and in the middle of all of that, if you can believe it, uh, we got a phone call from a relative telling us about three young children who had a history of abuse and neglect. And we were asked, will you take them? So while I'm fighting for my life, dealing with blended family, raising stepchildren, biological children, we then went and took in twin four-year-olds and a five-year-old who have a history of severe abuse and neglect and all the fallout of trauma and started a whole new round of parenting as well. Uh, so all that to say, you can imagine how uh, my nice, easy faith of the first half of my life didn't quite hold up to the reality of the human experience, of human pain and suffering. And what do we do with God in those places when he doesn't behave the way that we expected him to? What do we do then? That is just so much to have to go through. I cannot even imagine. Um, earlier this fall, I broke my hand and even that, you know, is not a huge deal, but it's like, oh, so frustrating just to, you know, have limited, like slightly, it was not a huge deal, but even just that limited range of movement on my hand as a writer was frustrating. I can't even imagine having to go through cancer and surgeries and adoption and all of the things, um, taking in additional children. So I want to ask you, in your book, you talk about 12 stones or markers. Can you tell us a little bit more about what those are and um, how we can use them as Christian women going through a tough time? Absolutely. Well, what we need to do is actually do it before we hit the tough time. If we haven't done, uh, if we have not built up our faith in God, on the truth of his reality and his affection and his presence, then when the worst happens, uh, it's kind of like building a house without laying down cement first. Uh, we won't be able to stand. Uh, all it takes is a, a, a swift storm to kind of knock everything, uh, knock everything flat. So the 12 stones really, it goes back to the story of Joshua and the Israelites crossing the Jordan River in the book of jo Joshua chapters three and four. Uh, Joshua is leading the Israelites after Moses. The Israelites have escaped 400 years of slavery and persecution in Egypt. They have then spent 40 years in the wilderness. God keeps telling them, I have a good life for you up ahead. The promised land is coming. I'm taking you to the promised land. Uh, but before they get to the promised land, they face the Jordan River. Now, this was not a creek not a stream. It was a raging river that was at flood stage. So that meant not only was it impossible to cross, but it would have been, it would have been a death sentence if they would have tried. 
And so God keeps saying, I have a good life for you up ahead, but here's this big old river right here, and I want you to cross it. And they're like, uh, that can't happen. So God told them, he told the priests in the middle of the Israelites to carry the Ark of the Covenant into the river. So the priests carry, they put their toes in the water. The minute their toes touch the water, the river parted in two. The waters piled up to the side. And the priest stood in the middle of the Jordan River on the, um, the dry ground underneath. They stood there carrying the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. The Israelites then could cross over to the other side, which was great news. But before God took them to the Promised Land, he told the Israelites to go back to the middle of the Jordan where the priests were standing and to grab 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan and then set them up on the side of the river as an altar. His reason for this was very simple. He told them he wanted them to remember the Lord's deliverance, to remember that it was his presence that delivered them through the middle of the worst circumstance. And the reason he wanted them to remember is because he knew, even though the promised land was up ahead, that there were going to be more hard things that they were going to have to deal with. So if more hard things were going to happen, they needed to remember the faithfulness of God before. They needed to have a reminder of God's history to carry them through their own present and future. And so that's what the 12 stones are about. Throughout the pages of Relentless, I encourage the reader to pull out 12 stones from their life, key moments where they experience the reality of God or a hint of his presence, or a confirmation of his love, and to set that up as a sort of memorial or an altar of remembrance. So that way, when the time comes that your life feels like it's been the rug's been pulled out from under you, you have a tangible reminder of the faithfulness of God. Here's the deal. When you and I face pain, we equate, we equate the presence of some kind of pain or difficulty to the absence of God. And if we don't have tangible reminders of his faithfulness and affection, we're going to listen to the voice of pain louder than the proof of his presence. So we need to have that altar sitting there right now, that reminder, those 12 stones. So that way, when that happens, we, and we deal with questions and doubt, we can go back to the truth of who God has always been. I love that. And I actually have, you know, I, even before um, hearing about your book, I know I have things in my life and in my home that I'm like, okay, this is a thing that I got, like a physical object that I got at some point that has some meaning to me because it reminds me of something or some way that God showed up. But let me ask you, when you were talking about these 12 stones, does it need to be actually 12 stones? Does it need to be 12 different things? Can it be one thing? Like, what does that look like? The point is, is for whoever's doing this exercise, whoever the reader is, to make it personal to you. I have right here to the left of me, as I'm in my office, I have a hat. It's like a hat box, a nice, beautiful box. Inside it are my 12 stones, but they aren't stones. They're items that I received, um, a verse that came to me at just the right day, at just the right time with the date on it. It's just written on an index card. There's a necklace that a friend brought to me with a message on it that came again at just the right moment at the right time. It's a collection of just items where God made it abundantly clear to me in that moment that, Michelle, I know it feels like the world's falling apart, but I need you to know I'm with you. And I collected these items. I have it in this box so that way I can physically look at it. I know some people who have literally taken stones and written a message on the stone. So you can certainly do that. It's not the object as much as, it's not the nature of the object as much as making sure it's some kind of tangible reminder of God's presence. What would you say to a woman who maybe she is a new Christian or she just hasn't been experiencing God's presence the way she wants to? And so when she's thinking of, okay, well, what would my 12 stones even be? And she can't even think of a time in her life, like when did God really come through for me in my life, what would you say, what could she do? Well, and that's part of what I walk through in this book. At the end of each chapter, I give you some su suggestions of where you can go back in your story, in your history, in your life experiences to find hints of God's presence. So chapter at a time, these 12 chapters, I give you some ideas and examples at the end of each chapter to walk through that. Some things do, first of all, don't underestimate the power of simply praying, God, open my eyes 
and help me see what I've missed. Simply praying, God, open my eyes, help me to see where, what I've missed. God wants to show himself to us. He wants us to see him. This, he's not a God that just loves playing hide and seek, and he, you know, he just wants to hide from us. He wants to be found. He wants us to see him. So pray that kind of prayer. God, help me to see what I have missed. The other thing to do is to go back to some of the most defining moments of your life, whether good or bad, these moments that really changed you, really impacted you. Go back there and look at them through a new lens. I've even made a timeline of my life marking all of the key moments where something significant happened. Then I go back and look at that timeline and I go, um, how did this bad thing that happened, how is it making possible something that's happening today? And can I see hints of God working in that situation, that scenario? Sometimes all we need is a fresh pair of eyes to look at situations or circumstances that we've been familiar with forever, a fresh set of eyes to look at them and go, oh, I'd never thought of it that way before. I love that. So that leads me into the next thing I wanted to ask you, which is a lot of times in our lives, we have things that we pray for. Maybe we're praying to be healed of some health condition or we're praying for a family member to get saved. How do we know when that is a prayer that God wants to answer and we just need to, you know, keep praying and praying and praying. And how do we know when it's time to stop praying and that God has said, no, like we're not going to do this. Like how can we kind of tell um, what to do with the things that we're dealing with? If it's something that we, you know, he's trying to help us struggle through well, or if it's something he's trying to heal us from, do you have an insight onto into that? Oh man, that's really one of the most difficult challenges of this walk of faith, right? To We pray for things, we want things, we don't get it answered. When do we know if we're praying for the right thing or not or all this? I go back to the story of Jacob. In the Old Testament, there's a man by the name of Jacob who there's one particular scene. First of all, Jacob's a little bit of a handful. I call him a hot mess because... You know, he was born the second born of a set of twins, but he manipulated his father to get the firstborn blessing. And he, I mean, there's all kinds of manipulation and deceit going on with Jacob. Uh, but we see in this moment where he's sleeping next to another river and uh, an angel of the Lord wrestles with him all night. Jacob's wrestling with this angel. Uh, and before the angel leaves, Jacob demands that he bless him, right? Well, the angel was God's presence with Jacob. And, um, and he ends up having his hip wrenched. So he has this wrench in his hip. He basically walks with a limp the rest of his life. But what I appreciate about that story of Jacob is that he doesn't stop wrestling with God. He continues to wrestle. And I've applied that to my prayer life in that I'm not going to stop praying for whatever is on my heart. I'm going to keep praying for it, keep praying for it, keep praying for it. Either God's going to give me an answer or he's going to change my desire. But either way, I may continue to pound the doors of heaven. The Bible talks over and over again about being persistent, uh, about persistency in prayer and continuing to go to God with it. If I'm going to wrestle with things, I want to wrestle with God himself over that. And so I just keep praying. What ends up happening is at times God gives me a, helps me to see the way he's already answering or he changes the desire of my heart in that circumstance. And that is its own answer. And I think that would be a great thing to pray too, just hearing you talk about this, that not even that you're just praying like, God, heal me or God, you know, help this person get saved or God, like do this specific thing, but hey, God, take care of this situation in the way that you see is best. You know, God, this is what I want, but if you want something else, like God, your will be done. And to be at a place where you can pray prayers like that, of God, this is what I want, but don't let my selfish, nearsighted, um, vision for my life supersede the vision that he has that's so much bigger that we don't know yet because we're still in the middle of it. Yeah, absolutely. Let me give you a really personal example, and it's a hard example, all right? So uh, this isn't going to be easy. Uh, after having cancer three times over nine years, I live with a constant awareness of the fact that it could come back at any moment. And if it comes back, my life my lifespan will be extremely short. Okay. Um, and I live with that knowledge all the time. You know, it's been almost a decade. I would say I'm used to it, but I don't know that you ever get used to that. However, in those initial years after first being diagnosed with cancer, my prayer was, 
God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Please, please take cancer away. I don't want to have cancer. Please make sure it doesn't come back. I mean, those were my prayers. And I prayed those prayers over and over and over and over again. Now, today, I still don't, I don't want to go through that again. I have zero desire to have cancer again, but my prayers have changed. And to me, that's even a testimony to God's presence with me, how he's changed me. Because what I've discovered is, is that what is at stake, what is most at stake in my life right now is not whether cancer comes back or not. The biggest stakes in my life right now are my faith. If I really believe what I say I believe, if I really believe that there is an eternity coming where I will be face to face with God, then what is most at stake, what is most on the line is my faith. So now when I pray, it's, well, I should say what's most at stake is my faith and the faith of those around me. So now when I pray, I still pray, God, I really don't want to have cancer. I really don't want to die. But my most important prayer and where I spend the most time, most passionate, is I say, please, God, strengthen my faith. Help my faith to not fail. No matter what happens, no matter what comes, strengthen my faith. Make my faith such that it would not fail. And then give me the wisdom and kindness and courage to strengthen the faith of the people around me. I love that. So let me ask you, when you are going through, specifically when you had cancer, but even now with just the fear of it coming back, how do you stay close to God? Just really practically speaking in such a time of grief and trial, how do you, um, the really pra practical action steps that you would take to make sure that your faith stays the most important when it's so easy to get distracted and so easy to get overwhelmed by all the things happening in your life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've had to change some of my approach to God. There was a time that I viewed God like a checklist, right? I have to do all the things. I have to make sure I have a 30-minute quiet time, and I have to read so many chapters from the Bible, and I have to do a Bible study, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. It was very much a transactional relationship with God. What I do now as a woman who has been, um, I've been significantly marked by medical trauma and PTSD and all of that and fear and anxiety, and I'm raising kids from trauma. What I'm learning is that uh, what I need most to stay close to him is just to be with him. And so sometimes that looks like sitting in my chair in my office and just sitting in his presence without doing much talking, just to be with him, to listen to him, to just be fully present to him. Uh, and that looks like sometimes uh, less boxes checked off my list. I still read my Bible almost every single day, but rather than try to hurry and get through an entire book or an entire chapter, I'll just hang out on a couple of verses. Uh, this morning it was Acts 9. I sat in my chair, I read half of Acts 9, and I sat there and then this was my prayer. Okay, God, what do you want me to see, know, or learn, or understand about you right here, right now? Help me to see you here. Open my eyes. And that's all I needed to say. And I just sat with him for a while. Uh, so some of it is um, lowering expectations. That would be a good first step. The second is simply make space to be with him. Um, third, I have to remind myself on an ongoing basis, based on the truth of his word, of how much he loves me. I spend less time worrying about disappointing him and more time bathing in the grace of him, the grace and affection of him. And those things help me stay centered and grounded uh, in the middle of this life. Um, God's presence with me and God's purposes for me and for those around me are the two anchors of my life. And the more that I can sit in those places and reflect on God's presence with me and purpose for me, uh, the more grounded I feel no matter what's happening in my external circumstances. That's great advice. Let me ask you about the opposite of that as well. So those are things that when you're in a season of grief, absolutely you should do. But as somebody who has been through such a rough, very long season of your life, are there any things that you would want to warn others to watch out for? Like it's so easy to think this way or it's so easy to do these things, um, but you don't want to do them. Is there anything like that that women should know, you know, be careful about this? Yeah, well, 
Okay, so this is this is where I'm at right now. The worst thing that you could do in a season of questioning or doubting or struggling with your faith is to do nothing. All right, sometimes we can get really comfortable in a place of doubt or or a comfortable in a place of questions. Um, but that's like, let's say you are lost in the woods. You go for a hike and you get lost in the woods. You wouldn't just sit down and set up camp and say, well, I guess I'm going to live here the rest of my life. If you were lost in the woods, you would do everything you could to find your way back home. You would not leave a stone unturned. You would do everything, use every tool at your disposal in order to wrestle your way through lostness to find your way back home. Um, be cautious about getting comfortable and, um, dare I say it, I'm be really bold, lazy in a place of doubt and question. Doubt is meant to be productive. Uh, Frederick, uh, Frederick Beekner says that doubt is the ants in the pants of your faith. Nobody is just going to get comfortable with ants in their pants, right? So let the questions and doubt and confusion you have lead you deeper on a journey of knowing what you believe. Rather than be afraid of it or pull back from it, push further in. Um, ask your questions. Have conversations with your friends about faith. S dig into the Bible. See, see um, from beginning to end what you learn about the character of God. But don't get complacent. Complacency, um, complacency now will wreck your faith when the bottom falls out. I love that. And especially how you say in your book, because we never know when those trials are going to hit. So if you were in a season right now where you were going through um, grief and trauma and trial, and it's a really hard time that you're dealing with, then yes, absolutely find those promises and cling to them. But even if you're in a time right now where everything's good and life is really good right now, making sure that you have still those stones, like you said, it really challenged me. Like I'm thinking, what else? Like what else could I put in a box? I have a couple of things already, but what else can I make sure that I have around? me so that I know, you know, God has come through before. He's done it before. Even if you haven't seen it in your own life, like you have a Bible full of examples of times where God came through um, and he's going to come through again. So we are almost to the end of our time here. But before I let you go, is there any last piece of advice or word of wisdom or message that you would love to share with our listeners today? The the final encouragement to you, and this is really practical. So we're going to get down dirty and practical right now. I want you to find an index card. It can be a three by five, a four by six. I, it can be a scrap piece of paper. Find a piece of paper. And I want you to write down the words of John 14, 18. It's Jesus's words. Okay. Jesus spoke these words. It is the theme verse of this entire book, but I want you to write it down on the index card. And this is what that verse says. Jesus is speaking and he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Pain makes us question the presence of God. Any kind of loss or confusion or difficulty or challenge that makes us feel alone. Our, our greatest fear, I think our greatest fear as humanity as a whole is the fear of being alone. And Jesus himself said, I will not leave you as orphans. I know you feel like an orphan right now. I know you feel abandoned right now, but I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. You write that down on the note card and tell you what, just carry it around for a week. Continue thinking about it. And I guarantee you, the more that you spend time reminding yourself of that promise, you'll start seeing evidence of God's presence with you even now. That's beautiful. And especially because as I'm thinking of the times when God has come through in my life, it usually has not been like this huge thunder. Well, it's never been a huge thunder <laughs> and lightning <laughs> kind of thing. But it's usually just a really small thing where I'm like, God, I'm going to trust you with this. And then like this little thing happens where you're like, is that a coincidence? And then another little thing and another little thing. And you're like, there's no way it's a coincidence anymore. But you have to have your eyes open to be able to to see these little things. Otherwise, you're going to totally miss them. So I love the idea of having the index card and being on the lookout because God is with you where you are. He's already doing things. He's already showing up. But are you taking the time? Are you slowing down? Are you looking for him enough to notice? So thank you, Michelle, so much for being on the podcast today and for sharing such awesome encouragement and practical steps that we can do, whether we're in the midst of these trials or even just to prepare ourselves because they're going to come at some point. 
Absolutely. They will. And you know what? Thank you so much for having me and having a really good, honest, frank conversation about some of these hard things. Because you and I, we need the practical in order to shore ourselves up for what may come down the road. And it's so much sweeter when we can do it together. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. So that just about does it for today's episode. But before we wrap up, there are three things that I want you to do. Number one, I want you to go check out Michelle's new book, Relentless, The Unshakable Presence of a God Who Never Leaves. It goes on sale November 12th, but if you pre-order it, it comes with a ton of really awesome bonuses. So absolutely go check that out. Get her book if that is something that you think you want to learn more. This is something that you could really use in your life. It looks phenomenal. Secondly, if you have already started thinking about what your 12 stones are, I've been thinking about mine too. So take some time today over the next couple of days to start compiling into a group. What are your 12 stones? What are the 12 things or however many you come up with? That's a manageable number for you. What are the things that you can say, this is proof that God has worked in my life before he has come through. He will come through again. Michelle shares more about this in her book. If you need more help coming up with things, but you may have something already on the top of your head. For me, I already grabbed, this is a little wooden cross that I got at a time where in my head, I was going through all of these things, you know, can I trust God with what is going on? And right at this minute when I am praying God, you know, God, like come through, do something, show me something. Um, a friend gave me this cross that she confidently trusts in the Lord right when I asked. Um, and it was just something that meant so much for me. So I have my first one already. I want you to think what in your life is a proof, is a symbol, is some kind of physical thing that you can hold and say, God has come through for me in the past. He will come through again. He will not leave. And then number three, the third thing that I want you to do is, as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and subscribe. We come back here all the time to bring you great interviews and great podcast episodes to help you be all in in faith and family because Christianity isn't easy, but you don't have to go through it alone. We are all in this together and I am here to help you and encourage you and equip you with whatever you're going through today. So grab Michelle's book. The links are in the show notes where you can learn all about it and the pre-order bonuses. Um, if you are watching this before her book goes live, grab your 12 stones start that um, compilation for yourself and absolutely subscribe there's a link below as well so thank you so much and i'll talk to you again soon all right bye